Hello everyone, this is Pastor Brown coming to you on a Wednesday, 12 noon, uh, and we are sponsored by Rising Ebenezer Baptist Church, uh, Ministry Department. We thank you for being here with us and I know that we really appreciate uh, your joining us in our Bible studies. We left off on last time in the book of Exodus. And if I'm not mistaken, we were dealing with uh, chapter 11. Uh, we stopped at the second verse of uh, Exodus 11. Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you for this privileged hour of coming together and meditating on your word. Let us be not only a listener, a hearer of your word, but also a doer. Help your uh, nuggets of, of, of knowledge and wisdom sink deep into our hearts and help us to know what is expected of, of us as followers of your Son. Father, we thank you for all things, but it is Jesus in whom we give the ultimate praise and glory. Thank you, Father for that door that leads to salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On last time, we saw where the ninth plague came into existence. And that ninth plague was darkness. The Bible teaches us in this book of Exodus that the darkness was so thick until it could be felt. And so that in and of itself was quite a plague upon Egypt. It lasted three days. And the greatest God they had in Egypt, the God that they thought was su supreme to all other gods, was the sun God. And yet God ultimately defeated the sun God. It was only after God decided to bring back the light upon the Egyptians that the sun came out. Note now that while there was darkness for three days and three nights in Egypt, in, in the land where the Israelis dwelt, there was plenty of light. God always makes a separation between His children and the secular world. He always takes care of His children. But there is one point that I need to bring out. And that is the fact that Israel was not a holy nation as a whole that Israel had started practicing the worship of the gods of Egypt. They were not squeaky clean nor lily white in their moral standards, standing with God. And some people feel that at this point, Israel was the good nation following after their God Yahweh, when in essence, when in truth, that was not the case. Let's look, if you will, at several passages that declare to us that Israel was, at this time, a, a nation that was practicing idolatry. The first one we can see 
is Leviticus 17, 7. Leviticus 17, 7. I want to show you from the word where Israel then, at that time, and even to this present time, do not honor God as they should. Let us look at 17.7. And it reads this way. And they shall no longer. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. After whom they have gone a whoring. This shall be a statue forever unto them throughout the generation. And then we turn, if you will, to the book of Joshua. Joshua 24, 14. Let's read that. Again, Joshua 24, 14. And it reads this way. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. One more, and then I will, I will go on. But I want to emphasize to you that God chose Israel, and Israel did not choose God. Um, let us look at Ezekiel now. Chapter 20, verses 6 through 9. And in many cases, all we know about Ezekiel are those dry bones. But he gives us an insight as to past history of the nation of Israel. Let us read. In the day that I lifted up my hand unto them to bring them forth of the land of Egypt into a land that I had spied for them flowing with milk and honey which is the glory of all lands then said I unto them cast ye away every man the abomination of his eyes and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt I am the Lord your God but they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me they did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes neither, neither did they forsake, forsake the gods of Egypt then I said I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. So we can see from those passages that Israel at this time was not a nation that was in love with God. Not a nation that feared God but a nation that had developed the habits of Egypt and the worship of Egypt's gods. And so we now can see that God was dealing with a people that needed to go into the wilderness to be changed, to be 
transferred from the old lifestyle of being in Egypt. And we will see when we come to that point where Israel failed and failed miserably. Let us now uh, uh, re-account uh, what has happened at the latter part of chapter 10 as we go into chapter 11. As I said before, uh, Pharaoh again hardened his heart and he told Moses that he did not want to see his face again. Upon which Moses said, well, that, that's, that's all right with me. And now we enter into chapter 11. After the nine plagues, which included the last one of, of darkness. And this is where we take up today's lesson. Chapter 11, beginning at the first verse. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards he will let you go hence. When he, will, when he shall let you go, he shall surety thrust you out hence altogether, which means he is going to literally push you out, shove you out. It will not be a fond farewell. Speak now in the ears of the people and let every man borrow of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor uh, jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt and in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. And there's a large a high probability that that was one of the reasons why Pharaoh was so stubborn. His jealousy of the position that Moses held among his servants and among the people of Israel, of Egypt rather, in general. They, they almost made uh, worship of him. And if you will remember when uh, Moses began his journey of deliberation for God uh, uh, of Israel, uh, that God told him that he would become like a God to the people and to the servants of, of Pharaoh. But Pharaoh had done what? He had hardened his heart. Four goes on to tell us, And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon the throne, even unto the firstborn of the maid servants that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. Think about it. What a day that was approaching where everyone, every household, excluding the Jews now, but the Egyptians, their herd, all would experience that thing called death. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or, or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord do put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. God looks out for his people. Always have 
and always will. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out and all the people that follow thee. And, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Now, Moses, no doubt, had moments of doubt. For you see, time after time, as a matter of fact, for nine different times, on nine different occasions, it seemed at first that Pharaoh had succumbed to the pressure that God had placed upon him and his land. Only to hear Pharaoh change his mind. Only to have him renege on that promise that he was going to let the children of God go. And so it took it took faith, consistent faith, for Moses to continue. Now, no one's going to tell me that there were not times in, in the battle that Moses had uh, within. That maybe he had made a mistake and maybe God wasn't strong enough to break the bonds of slavery for his people. But the beautiful thing about this man called Moses is that he continued, he persisted in his obedience to God. Verse 9, And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh shall not hearken unto you that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt, that's one reason why God was so patient. That's why he gave these nine plagues. To show not only the Egyptians and the, and, and, and the Jews as well. Because we, we've read that they were not God-fearing people. That as a whole they started worshipping the gods of their captors. And so God had to prove not only to the secular world, not only to the heathens of that day that he was God, but he also had to prove it to those who were skeptics, those who were straddling the fence, those who could not properly make up their mind. And Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh. And the Lord hearkened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. And the Lord spake, we're going to chapter 12 now. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying this month shall be unto you the beginning of months and, and that month is uh, 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 April uh, we, uh, uh, in our calendar it, it, it is the month of April and it shall be the first month of the year to you speak ye unto the congregation of Israel saying in the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers a lamb for an house and if the household be too little for the lamb let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it 
according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count of the land. Now, we want to believe that a household that needed to go and join with their neighbor had to be a household of, of ten or less. And um, uh, any household, the, the maximum, um, I'm told, uh, would be 20 souls in a house. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out of the she sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening on the 14th day and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two sides two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses when they shall eat it notice where the blood was not applied applied it was not applied to uh, to the entrance uh, uh, of, of, of the door to the bottom of the door because God's blood is never to be stepped on never to be uh, disrespected and walking on on, uh, on the, the sacrifice blood would, would encounter this type of disrespect and they shall eat the flesh in that night Roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. The criteria for doing what God said would be what? To roast the lamb with fire, to eat bread that had no leaven in it, and leaven is that ingredient that causes the bread to rise and you will see down through scripture where God says not to use leaven in their bread because leaven leaven gives rise uh, uh, to to the bread as I said before it is a an indication of pride and arrogance and so the bread the bread was flat and not one of any height. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden, meaning don't boil it, at, at all with water, but roast with fire. Fire means judgment. And that's what God wanted this meat to be prepared by fire to be cooked by fire his bread his head with his legs and with the uh, pertinence thereof meaning all that is inside and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning and that which remain of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire and thus Shall ye eat it with your loins girded? Meaning you go, you're going to eat it with, with, with all of your clothes on, your shoes on your feet, ready to travel, and your staff in your hand. Notice now, these uh, Jews, their main occupation was to be a shepherd. That was their uh, main occupation was tending and caring for sheep. But notice here, you see only a staff. You do not see the rod. I believe the reason for that was God was going to himself def defend the sheep that would ordinarily 
be used of a rod. God was going to take care of not only the Jewish people as a nation, but he was also going to look out for, out for any predator that would try and consume, consume the sheep. So they did not need the rod. They only needed the staff. Amen. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Let me go back. When it talked about eating bitter herbs, it was to be a continuation of a celebration. Not only was this Passover for that moment, but it was a mem memorial that was to be passed on to every generation uh, in the future. Uh, so they, they ate the bitter herbs as a reminder of the hardship they went through in, in Egypt. Verse 12. Fire will pass through the land, Lord have mercy, of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beasts. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Egypt, you depended on your gods, and I'm going to, I'm going to, in my wrath, defeat them because you will be calling on them for help, and they will fail you because I am God, and besides me, there is none other. 13, and the blood shall be to you for a token unto the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. This is a promise. And God has made us a promise. Though we are not what we should be. Though we're not doing as we completely ought. For by grace are ye saved. And that not of yourself. You're saved through faith. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. When a person will admit that he needs God, God is able to save him. If you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It is a faith walk. These people followed God not because they were sure, but because they had faith. Not because their lives were perfect, but because Moses and Aaron told them about God's love for them. And even in their failure to Completely honor God. God kept his word. There's not a one who's listening to me now. Who can raise his or her, or her hand. And say that I have been totally faithful to God. If you have raised your hand, you lie. Because the Bible says all have sinned. And all have come short of his glory. This is exciting news for all of God's children. But what he says, it shall come to pass. And God has made us promises, hasn't he? He has made us promises that, that, that are so wonderful. So wonderful. That we shake our heads almost in disbelief. That God is going to give us 
a treasury that is far beyond our imagination. As I glance, I see that time has come to an end. And I thank you for listening. I look forward to us getting together again. God willing, of course. And with that, I bid you God speed. And until we meet again, may God continue to bless you and yours. Until next week at this time, grace and peace be unto you.